We live today in a broken world. We have broken homes, broken schools, broken churches, broken bodies, broken relationships, broken hearts, broken spirits. This brokenness is felt even by nature itself that continues to groan in pain. One scientist describes the planet Earth as suffering from a cancer that has metastasized and manifests itself in super typhoons, earthquakes, and climate change. We we'll live not only in a broken world, but in a dangerous world. Crime and violence have invaded our streets, our schools, our homes, even our churches. The increase of school shooting in the United States, the recent terroristic act in Paris, among others, illustrate that there is no safe place. Even sporting events, shopping malls, movie houses, restaurants can be targets of those who want to sow seeds of terror. When we are in the plane, when we drive our cars, when we ride a train, when we are on vacation cruise, there is no guarantee that we are safe. So how shall we live in this broken and dangerous world? And as Christians, what kind of witness can we offer to the world? Or as a church, what kind of people shall we be? I began thinking about this sermon in the aftermath of the Paris tragedy. I listened to the fears and hopes expressed in the mass media and the social media. I listened to the rhetorics of political and religious leaders, as well as the voices of the ordinary citizens. And I wrote down three things on how Christians ought to be, or how Christians should be, or must be. First, we must be people of visions. Visions and dreams are language of the Spirit. The Bible says in the book of Joel and in the book of Acts, in these last days, God declares, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. The young shall see visions, the old shall dream dreams, and whoever who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Proverbs remind us that without vision, people perish. But we must discern whether our vision is of the right spirit. For there are visions that are lofty and noble. And there are also visions that are born from a different spirit. In the United States, where presidential election is coming, we hear some of these visions that appeal to our basic instincts. There is a vision that appeals to our instinct of self-preservation. This country is our country. This land is our land. Let us deport the 12 million immigrants who are illegal. Let us build a great wall and close our borders, or else we will have no country and no land. There is a vision that appeals to our basic instinct of fear. There are 10,000 Syrian refugees coming to our country. They may be potential terrorists, so let us close our doors. We cannot jeopardize the security of our country. And there is a vision that appeals to our basic instinct of partisanship and discrimination and, and prejudice. Let us welcome only the Christians and the Jews. The Muslims, we must not accept their Muslim refugees because we are not sure if they come with good intentions. For all we know, they might be the Trojan horse of the ISIS. While these visions may appeal to our emotions and feelings and sometimes have facts, 
The questions we ask as Christians is, are these visions godly? Are these visions of the Holy Spirit? Or to use an evangelical jargon, WWD, what would Jesus do? If this world in which we live is broken, if our relationship is broken, then our vision must be not about what must be not about fragmentation or exclusion, but one of reconciliation. Second Corinthians chapter five says, "God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, and He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation." As Christians, among other people, we should become leaders and prime movers of this ministry of reconciliation. When I first came to this church, uh, couple, more than a year, two years ago, I addressed myself to see an interracial congregation at this 11 o'clock service. Elmhurst in Queens is one of the most racially culturally, ethnically, and religiously diverse cities in New York and in the world. There are more than 200 languages spoken in a two-mile radius. There are some 125 countries represented, many churches, many synagogues, shrines, and temples representing various faiths. So if St. James must become a light of Christ in this community, we must see a vision of harmony where people from diverse backgrounds may experience an ease in relationships. Our vision must be in sync with the mission of the Episcopal Church, which is to reconcile to unity with God and His other in Christ. Our vision must appropriate the vision of Shalom, the peaceable kingdom where the wolf lives with the lamb, the leopard with the goat, the lion with the calf, and they neither hurt each other in this holy mountain. I quote Martin Luther King Jr., who in 1968 spoke these words, We must face the sad fact that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, when we stand to sing, In Christ there is no east or west, we stand in the most segregated hour in America. For more than 30 years have passed, there are still vestiges of this Christian apartheid, the white church, the black church, the Asian church, the Latino church, the Korean church, the Chinese church, the Filipino church. To a large extent, these churches are born out of the proven principles of church growth, homogeneity. Birds of the same feather flock together. To a certain extent, they are driven by language. We must worship God in the language of our hearts. But sometimes, and to many instances, they are also driven by our lack of hospitality and fear of the stranger. I remember when my wife and I first came to the U.S., we went to a small parish and we expected to be welcomed. We thought that they would be happy to have new members. But when we entered the church and introduced ourselves as coming from the Philippines, the country where St. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians, I'm just joking. The answer said, Oh, do you know that there is a Filipino church on the other side of the street? Outwardly, we thought they simply wanted to be helpful. But inwardly, we felt that we don't belong. We're not welcome in the church. Recently, at the convention of the Long Island Diocese, our Bishop Larry Provenzano made a special mention of the growth of St. James. In just two years, we made a lot of progress. We have turned around this church from 20 to over 100 members, from maintenance to mission, from decline to survival and growth. But the one that cannot be measured is the growth and vision of a healed church and a reconciled world. 
we have become a growing congregation of rainbow colors, black and white, yellow and red, Anglos, Latinos, Caribbean, West Indies, Chinese, Filipinos, Koreans, Indians, Bangladesh, Indonesians, Burmese, Thai. We are becoming a shining symbol of one, of, of one church with many cultures and races. But I would be lying if I tell you that it is easy to build a community in the context of diversity. For it is our basic human instinct to build walls. I simply do not mean the fence outside this building that prevent us or that shield us from malevolent intruders. I mean the walls that we build in our hearts that cover our eyes from seeing the possibility that when we welcome strangers, when we welcome the new people, we are actually welcoming angels unaware. Our walls may be the color of their skin, the accent of their English language, the smell of their food, their sexual orientation, their cultures and tradition, their political ideology, their theological backgrounds, and sometimes even the thought, can they bring money, can we bring gifts, or can they be a burden to us? No, we cannot be free from our prejudice through our words. We cannot be united by a committee. We cannot be reconciled by a vestry. Only Jesus Christ can free us from the gloom and doom that we place in our hearts. Only Jesus Christ can shatter the walls that we have placed upon ourselves. Only Christ can unite us. Only Christ can reconcile us. So we must not only have visions, but we must also become people of prayer. Prayer changes things because God changes things. Second Chronicles 7.14 said, If my people who are called by my name shall pray and humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I shall hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Much of our prayers are prayers for ourselves. There is nothing wrong with that. But too much petition with little thanksgiving would make our prayers self-serving. Like talking to a Santa Claus, we present God with a shopping list. Lord, give me this, give me that, and I want it right now. The book of James said, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passion. Some people come to church only when they are in need, but once they meet that need, that need they re don't return to give thanks. Very much like the ten lepers who were cleansed and only one returned. They come to pray for jobs and when they get a job, they don't come back. I know I have blessed many cars, but after I blessed these cars, the drivers do not return anymore. So let our prayers be more of thanksgiving than of asking. Today, in our thanksgiving, we have the symbol of our pledges, one of the effective ways of giving thanks to God for the blessings that you receive is to bless for the work of the church. In this broken and dangerous world, the prayers that we need to develop are prayers of transformation, that God in His mercy and grace would transform the hearts of God's children all of God's children, that they shall turn their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks, that they turn their guns into ointments and their bombs of destruction into bombs of healing and grace. I remember the story of a missionary who went to Africa to evangelize the natives. While there he saw a big bad lion looking hungry and ferocious. He tried to run away, but the lion was faster. So he decided to stop, kneel down, and close his eyes and pray, Lord, change the heart of this lion. 
into a heart of a Christian so that he would eat me. When he opened his eyes, he saw that the lion was also kneeling. He was so happy that the lion was converted until he heard the lion pray, God is great and God is good and I thank him for this food. You know, laugh. Well, maybe our prayers cannot change the nature of the beast. But if our prayers cannot change others, our prayers should change us. When I was young and spiritually immature, whenever someone did something wrong to me, I want to take revenge. I get stressed just thinking how I can get even. I think many of us are like that. But when I learn to pray, I am able to look at things from another perspective. Jesus said, you heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mahatma Gandhi added, he was a lover of Christ, but not really an admirer of Christians. Mahatma Gandhi said, if we live with eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth, we will live this world full of people who are toothless and blind. So let us pray for the leaders of the nations. Here in the Episcopal Church, we pray every Sunday for our President Barack Obama and our Governor Andrew Cuomo. We do this not only perfunctorily that they may make wise and just decisions, and serve the welfare of the people. We pray with the awareness of the burdens that they carry in this political spectrum, as well as in other forms of leadership. It is easier to criticize. It is easy to condemn. It is easy to judge. But it is hard, very hard to lead. We also pray for the spiritual leaders of the world that religion will not become an opiate of the people or a tool of oppression or violence. With the rise of religious fanaticism, it is easy for unscrupulous religious leaders to exploit their people at the expense of others. War can sometimes be more brutal and more cruel when religion is brought into it. When someone says, I kill you because I hate you, the blood is only in his hands. But when someone says, I kill you because God hates you, there is double jeopardy. God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Allah, the name is taken in vain. You put Allah, Yahweh, Jehovah, or God as a false God. In the Old Testament, Moloch is the name of the false god who demanded sacrifice from his children and delights in the blood of their enemies. That is not a true god. The true god is not a jihadi god. The true god is not a crusader god. The true god is not a holy war god. The true god is not a tribal god who shows partiality over other tribes. The true God is a universal God who shows no partiality, but who loves the world so much. He yearns to draw all humankind to himself and want them to live in peace and harmony. He loved the world so much that he gave them the peace child, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. One of the things that struck me about Pope Francis was his oft-repeated word to the people, please pray for me. We are used to thinking that the clergy are the ones who are bound to pray for the lay people. The truth of the matter is that the ordained leaders need more prayer. I have known of bishops who have suffered from depression, burnout and stress from the job. If I as an ordinary priest has a headache this big, the bishops have a headache this big. 
So we must pray for our bishops, pray for the archbishops, the cardinals, and the pope. And of course, to you, my dear ones, I hope you pray for me as well. And I thank you for when I was on radiation from prostate cancer, you have prayed for me many times. But after two years that I have been to this church, I have known which pew you sit. Even when I come here alone, sometime on a weekday, I would imagine practically most of you where you are sitting. And then I would lay my hands on those pews and pray for you. And then I know that there are also vacant pews. And then I pray that on Sunday when someone new comes in and sits in that pew, I pray that they will hear the word and receive the Lord. They know the beauty of worship. So we must be a people of visions, a people of prayer, and finally, we must be a people of faith. Hebrews 11 defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is calling things that are not yet as if they are. One of our Sunday schools, uh, Sunday school kids who just arrived from the Philippines, was excited to see so many foods on the table. And he said to his grandma, Grandma, we are rich. That's right. Let the poor say, I am rich. Let the weak say, I am strong. Because of what the Lord has done. That is faith. But the opposite of faith is fear. It's not doubt. It is fear. Fear. When you act out of faith, hope, and love, you act in one of the highest values of life. But when you act out of fear, you act out of the basis, the lowest instinct. When we think and act out of faith, we hit the mark of God. But when we act and think out of fear, we miss the mark. Peter was walking on the water. He just defied nature. But when he saw the waves, he felt afraid, and fear sunk him down. That is why the message of the angel is, do not be afraid. In my culture, we have a word for faith, and that is, bahala na. Literally, it means, God wins. In the end, God wins. In the book of Revelation, we see scenarios of gloom and doom that seem to correspond with the events happening in our time. Revelation 6 speaks about the end times, the coming of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, famine, pestilence, and death. And Jesus spoke about this cataclysmic event that is happening. There will be wars and rumors of war. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But the story of Jesus did not end in death, but in resurrection and ascension. The Jesus movement is there, continues. The Bible story hinges on the words of Jesus written today in our, in our reading. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. When, I, when, when we rise in the morning, and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea. God is there. When we climb to the highest heights, or when we go to the deepest depths, God is there. Our new presiding bishop, Michael Carey, summoned Episcopalians to the Jesus movement. It is a vision of evangelism and racial reconciliation. To me, it sounds like back to the basics and back to the future. The book of Hebrews says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His mercies never change. His love never change. If He saved you today, he's, if He saved you yesterday, He saves you today, and He will save you tomorrow. If He loved you yesterday, He loves you today, and He will love you tomorrow. God will not leave us nor forsake us. So let us join this 
Jesus' movement and join the line dance of human salvation. For even after the music died down and the, the, the bells of clanging faded, God is still there. In the end, God wins. Not the terrorists, not the extremists, not anyone. God wins. So, as our presiding bishop quoted the song, Don't worry, be happy. Fear not, rejoice, and be glad. The Lord wins. Amen. Amen.